So I'm passing around a couple of copies of my book. If you're being handed something and you're like, what is that? This, that's me. Um, I'm going to talk about the book, but I'm going to talk about the process that I went through to create the book first. And so I thought it'd be nice for you to get your hands on it as well. So in 2009, I was diagnosed with endometriosis. It's a disease that has no cure and that causes problems with the reproductive organs of millions of women. In about a third of the cases, it causes infertility, and in all cases, it causes a lot of pain surrounding uh, reproduction, both physical and psychological pain. And a few months, I guess, after my diagnosis, I was chatting with a friend who is also an artist and who also happens to have endometriosis, and <laughs> we were just talking, and then suddenly she said to me, you know, very earnestly, whatever you do, don't make art about it. Do not make paintings of your vagina. And I get what she's saying, right? Because, you know, uh, 40 years ago or so, uh, paintings of uteri and lady bits, they maybe had a certain impact with the women's movement, and they, they not maybe, they did, and they were important. But in today's world, I'm not sure that they would have a, a real meaning. And so I still knew that endometriosis was going to manifest itself in my work in some way because it was changing my identity significantly. And so I started to think about what, how infertility is viewed in our society. And <laughs> for sure it's viewed as bad, right? Because some of my stuff that works in a lot of you doesn't work for me. And so that's a bad thing. It's viewed as sad because we seem to think that one of the purposes of life, or maybe the main purpose of life, is to make more of it. And I probably can't do that. And it's also viewed as a little suspicious. You know, I, was, I would talk with friends about my fertility issues, and they were kind of nervous about it. Like, if they talked about it, it would happen to them. Um, these are very you know, smart people, but we still, we still don't understand a lot about fertility, actually. So that's part of where their superstitious response comes from. So bad, sad, suspicious. And it occurred to me that there are other things in our world that are viewed that way. You know, like men who stay home and raise the children, uh, women who focus on their careers, men who dress colorfully, women who are taller than most men, homosexuals, transgendered people. Lots of people are viewed as bad, sad, and suspicious. And what they all have in common is this formula that for some reason we, we like hold it up as this ideal. Um, and that formula is working man plus nurturing woman equals 2.5 children and a lifetime of bliss. And this formula obviously doesn't work, and not just because I'm pretty sure children only come in whole numbers, <laughs> but um, most of us deviate from it in some way. And what I realize is that when you get us all together, all of the people who don't follow the formula, we actually are the mainstream. And we need to start thinking more in those terms. Instead of being marginalized groups that are marginalized from each other as well, we need to embrace that there's this formula that's oppressing all of us. So I was thinking about that. And I was also thinking about how in like maybe 2007, I read a book by uh, Dr. Joan Roughgarden. She's an evolutionary biologist. And the book is called Evolution's Rainbow. And among other things, this book is an anthology of species who don't fit, their behaviors don't fit with our traditional notions about gender. And so I was thinking about that as well. And then I also had this, this flash of how we learn about how boys and girls are supposed to be when we're very young. And so I decided I wanted to write a children's book, and this whole animal thing came into it because we teach our kids a lot about morality using animals as metaphor, like the clever fox or the hardworking ant, things like that. And so I mushed all of those ideas together, and I created a series of paintings and a book called Crime Against Nature, and that's what's floating around. And the crime that I'm talking about in Crime Against Nature is the misinformation we've all been fed about what is actually natural behavior. Um, so the, I'm going to show you, in case you haven't seen the book, I'm going to show you some images from the book. This is a fanfin sea devil. Uh, the main figure, the main fish that you see is the female. This small pink spot in the lower left is the male. So girls can be bigger than boys. Boys can also be prettier than girls. This is probably the most obvious example of that, the um, blue peafowl. And boys and girls don't always have babies. 
So among gray wolves, as many of you probably know, not all individuals reproduce. So crime against nature is 56 such species that in some way um, open up our ideas about what is natural behavior. And now I'm going to talk about the making of one piece in particular. This is a, this is a drawing of a Dyak fruit bat who's, um, it's a male who is nursing his child, and, or his, his young. And um, this is how most of my paintings start out, as sketches like this. And to create this sketch, I was working from six, eight, ten photos that I found online in books. I even played a lot of nature videos, and I stalked them on my computer with my camera, and I was taking pictures of my screen. Um, I had a pretty specific idea of what I wanted my Diag fruit bat to be doing. No one had taken that picture, so I had to, you know, mix together what they were doing and, and make my own image. And then I transferred the sketch onto a piece of wood that was my painting. And I started painting. And so these images that I'm going to show you now are taken days apart, weeks apart, months apart. Remember, I was making 56 of these paintings, and I was also doing you know, my other work. So I work on a lot of paintings at the same time. You know, here I just added a bunch of green. I hope it's, it's clear that this is all on the same piece of wood. And what may or may not be obvious to you is this painting is a big mess, and I don't really know what I'm doing. And so I do what I often do when I'm struggling with a work, and that's that I look around. And in this case, I looked to Western art history, to the most famous parent and child in Western art history, the Madonna and Child. This is by Cimabue from 1285. Um, this one's by Bellini. It's from the 1400s. Botticelli, also from the 1400s. These three that I've just shown you, they're really lovely images. They're kind of the, the images that we think of when we think of the Madonna and Child, you know, very sweet and or iconic. But this is the image that really juiced me. <laughs> it's by Jean Fouquet. It's very modern, but um, it's actually from 1450. And I love sort of the comically placed breasts and um, the like almost like rubbery finish on the cherubs. It was just too weird. And it was perfect for what I was looking for. So I went back into that same painting that I was showing you the process shots from before. And I washed over the whole painting with white to sort of cut out the noise of the bad painting that it was. <laughs> and I went back in and I found the lines that were working. And then I started in with Fouquet's color schemes and, you know, kept at it. And it just really wasn't working. It wasn't going anywhere. So I went back to the drawing board and I made this sketch. And um, what I'm going to point out in this sketch is the strong vertical and horizontal of the, the branches there. And I was trying to mimic the throne, the vertical and the horizontal of the throne in Fouquet's piece. And recomposing the image using Fouquet's piece really, like, you know, using that um, strong vertical and horizontal was so useful to me. And I was able to start a whole new painting. So this is on a new piece of wood. And I'm building up the layers, just like last time, over days, weeks, months, until I eventually finished the painting. <laughs> and the reason why I wanted to talk about the process, process of this painting in this context with you, I, I am going to get back to freedom and to internet and to connectivity, um, is that it's a really great example of what I do in all of my work. It demonstrates so clearly how I use other artists' work to make my own. And all artists do this. Even those who deny it, <laughs> they definitely do it. And this is because art is not made in a vacuum. And if it was, if that was possible, it would have no meaning. Without context, culture has no meaning. So um, I think the reason why artists tend to deny how much they rely on other artists to make their work is in part an ego thing. We like to think that we're so original. Um, but it's, I think, also really about fear. And it's a fear that I know all too well. I don't know if you noticed, but I showed you all kinds of embarrassing images of a bad painting in process. <laughs> but I did not show you the photos that I worked from to make that first sketch. And I will not show them publicly, not in the climate as it is, not in uh, a world where copyright law is as it is. I just. I feel good morally about how I use those images, but legally speaking, I'm in a gray area. And uh, I don't want to call down the wrath of the copyright gods, as it were, because they are temperamental and they are expensive. And this is um, 
this is really at the, the core of, I think, what we've all been talking about. Um, copyright law as it exists does not protect me. It probably does not protect most people in this room. It protects people with lots of money and corporations. It protects the parties who have the money to use the legal system to their benefit. And so for a law or a set of laws that are intended to nurture creativity, that's a big fat fail and we need to do something uh, to fix it. I think that part of where we went wrong in all of this is in thinking about how artists, uh, creatives of any kind, make their living. We have this, this myth that an artist makes a thing and then sells that thing, um, or they sell reproductions of that thing, whatever. No, this has never happened. I don't know why we think of it like this. This is not what's going on when an artist is making a living. What's happening is that an artist is making a thing, and then that artist is sharing that thing freely in some way, or with a community. Maybe it's a defined community, but they're still sharing it openly. And then they are making connections through their work. And it's those connections that allow the artist to make a living. Am I running out of time already, David? Oh. So, um, so this artist makes, makes these connections, right? Uh, and uh, these connections allow them to make a living, like for example, through public patronage, you know, through, if you have developed an audience, you can crowdsource your funding, um, or through grants, but also private patronage, someone can commission you, um, but also through special editions of your work. So this is maybe obvious in the case of my book, for example. I give away free copies of my book online, but if you want a special edition of the book, a print edition of the book, then you need to pay for it. But this has been going on, like, since forever, right? Um, artists will show their work, you know, physical, physically show their work or show it online for free. You have access to it. But if you want to take it home and see it in your home, you need to buy it. Um, and so all of this gets back to what I was talking about at the be beginning, the bad, sad, suspicious. When I referred to copyright and the fear about copyright, I referred to um, the gods of copyright and <laughs> how wrathful they are. Um, and in, in the same way, if you're someone who, like me, who is absolutely a copyright law radical and does not believe in copyright, you tend to um, have disapproval at you from society because you're challenging notions about where, where power is um, and power that we don't even understand. So the gods of copyright, like I'm talking about. And it's similar with uh, sexuality and uh, gender roles. So I think what I'm trying to do today is encourage everyone to think again about why they think 